Hi, my name is Mia Mulder, and welcome to one of my fireside chats. Today we're going to talk about free speech and fake universities. We're going to dabble in a little history, we're going to dabble in a few liberty rights, but before we do that, let's build a foundation. I am being silenced by everyone who I don't like. In my time on YouTube, I've learned two things. One, never read the comments, except for the good ones. And two, if you say the wrong thing on the internet, you will lose everything. You will lose your entire career. You must watch your speech, lest ye be cancelled, either by people or by algorithms. Obviously, this is horrifying. What kind of world do we live in when you can't even spread misinformation without any sort of consequence? This is clearly a free speech violation. This will warm up my peaches and I am not okay with it. But let's talk about that today. Free speech and what it actually means to limit speech. Because you may think that we don't actually limit speech that much. But the truth is very complicated, and maybe the people who are concerned about free speech are actually onto something. For some reason, it seems like YouTube influencers are tasked with talking about free speech quite a lot. I don't really know why. Probably it's because of our overinflated sense of ego and the idea that we know everything and therefore have to blabber about pseudo intellectual concepts for 45 minutes. Maybe. But I also think that being on YouTube puts us in a very specific viewpoint that most people don't really have access to. And this, for some reason, makes us think that we're more qualified. Although I do also think that I am qualified to talk about this because, you know, I have some viewpoints. And free speech means that I can say those viewpoints and no one can criticize me because I tried. Many discussions about free speech on YouTube have revolved around things like college campus discussions and deplatforming. Why the left has to suppress free speech. The left controls universities. There is little to no dissent allowed at universities. Is it a violation of free speech to block someone from having a speech at your campus? I mean, no. And that's the video. Thank you very much for watching. I'd like to thank my Patreons. I'd like to thank my sponsor for this video, Skillshare. I'd like. Oh, wait. Uh, that's. Uh, hold on. I mean, no. But maybe there's something there. Many discussions have also talked about online free speech. If you say the wrong thing on Twitter, you might get banned. If you say the wrong thing on YouTube, your channel might get suspended. And is that a violation of free speech, too? Well, I think it falls within the purview of the free speech category. I think it's worth to talk about. What does it mean to have free speech? And what does it mean when platforms have their own definitions of what should be allowed? A lot of people, no matter their political inclinations, will say that their speech is being suppressed. Not by government, but by more factors that we'll get into. And with that in mind, let's talk about what free speech is, what free speech isn't, and the perilous journey of a fake online university. Let's uh, dial up the lights a little bit, perhaps. Make it a bit more comfy for us. Yeah. So, what even is free speech in the first place? Well, it's an idea that we, who live in a society, should have the right to discuss and express ideas freely, without consequence. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peacefully to assemble, and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Me. I'm James Madison. Me, 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 me. The idea of free speech is pretty central to all sorts of political discussions. If we're going to discuss a topic, we should be able to talk about it freely without being worried about the thought police or the actual police. Free speech doesn't just cover the specific words that you express, 
It covers your right to express ideas, sentences, to be able to associate with various political groups. All of these things fall under a general umbrella of free speech and free association, or freedom of expression, however you want to express that idea. But basically, the government can't punish you for having certain ideas. Specifically, no one should be punished by the state for having an opinion. We take it for granted now, but for most of human history, it's not something that people had. It's still a fairly new concept. If you had an idea that was dangerous to the social order, you may find yourself being led away by police. And expressing those ideas could often be lethal, which to many people in the past was obvious. Of course, you badmouth the king. You are being disloyal, treasonous even. You, of course, you should be punished for having those ideas. But once democracy is starting settling into place, people realize that the only way to actually have a democracy is to have an open exchange of ideas and discussions. We can't talk about how to do politics if one side isn't allowed to utter their opinion. Debate between differing ideas would, in theory, lead to better ideas. Ideas that more people would agree with. The conflict in debate would lead to better resolutions. Or at least, that's the theory. At least society won't be run by whatever the king wants to do anymore. And now we can all have a say. The philosopher John Stuart Mill wrote that free speech is important not just for the individual, that is, not punished for expressing their ideas, but is good for society as a whole. Because it forces us to reevaluate viewpoints that we already think that we know. It keeps us away from the tyranny of apathy. If our ideas aren't challenged, they won't improve. Which is a fair idea, I think. If we can all reevaluate our ideas, then we will learn to become better. We shouldn't be afraid of speaking things that we think are true, but we should be able to do so so that if we are wrong, real truth will emerge. Mill was one of the most influential English philosophers of the 19th century, and a very foundational thinker and writer on classical liberalism. People who just love their freedom. And you know, people today who describe themselves as a classical liberal are also people who are really into the idea of free speech. They really like free speech. It should be as free as possible. So Mill in theory writes that free speech will make society better, that the free utterance of ideas is a good thing. But Mill also defended the British Empire and the colonization of India, which is a bit yikes. One wonders how much free speech Mill thought that people in India should have when they argued against imperial oppression. Uh. Mill argued for an enlightened despotism to civilize the barbarians, and that this was a crucial first step to a civilized life of liberty which uh, nothing but foreign force would induce a tribe of North American Indians to submit to the restraints of a regular and civilized government. Enlightened despotism? More like... <sighs> so even to Mill, the idea of free speech came with limitations. It was more an idea rather than a practical fact. And much like today, free speech isn't this absolute pure fact or right, it has a lot of um, rules connected to it. When it comes to free speech in practicality, there are three different opinions. One opinion is that speech should be as absolute as possible. No limitations to what you're about to say, anything goes, don't worry about it. And that's an example of what Mill kind of wanted. No limitations whatsoever, if we can prevent it. The other opinion though, on the other side of the spectrum, is no free speech. An example here are, for example, a lot of dictatorships where you're not allowed to question the regime, not allowed to reference certain historical events, or just not allowed to express ideas that may not align with the people in charge. And the third position here is this sort of grey area in between. How do we navigate that? Because you could argue that like we should have free speech, free speech is good, and no free speech is bad. Yeah. But almost every place on earth falls in the grey area. 
there are a lot of speech that is restricted. For example, the most common example is you can't yell fire in a crowded theater because that might lead people to become injured in a panic. You are not allowed to threaten the life of the President of the United States at all. Which is interesting because threats are usually only legal if it's actionable and probable. But no one at all is allowed to threaten the President of the United States. So I have some tweets to delete. Harassment is probably out of there too. Hate crimes are not allowed as speech in some countries, which I think that most of us would agree is a good thing. The question then is, where do you draw the line? Mill has some thoughts here as well. He proposed something called the harm principle. The harm principle specifically states, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. So basically, if speech causes harm, then it's okay to restrict it. But there's the crux of the issue. What is harm? Moreover, how do you define what the limits should be on free speech? Even if we agree that limits should exist, and again, not everyone agrees with that, how do you agree what kind of limits there should be? Should they be arrested? Fine. Kept from speaking? In almost all discussions about these types of restrictions, the restriction affects the speaker because they are the one doing the speaking, because that's the point of contention. If you need to limit a form of speech, it makes sense to go after the speaker. It's kind of hard to imagine any other type of suppression, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. But it should be said though that these questions about what is harm and what isn't, what is justified as free speech and what isn't, they can't be answered. No one really can answer them. It's what we in the biz call a tough nut. A philosophical conundrum. But what we can do is mindlessly pontificate about it for 35 minutes and then feel smarter about ourselves afterwards. But here's another crux of the issue. When people complain about the limit of free speech, I think people are mostly referring to the spirit of what free speech should do. The result of what free speech laws should create. To free speech absolutists, that means a level playing field where every idea can be discussed in an equal manner. So one side is arguing about the spirit of the law, while another is arguing about the like the letter of the law. Lawmakers have been forced to sort of compromise here. The spirit of the law to keep things on an even playing field and have open and free discussion should still be something to strive towards, but that's not practically possible. Plus we live in a society that isn't fully equal, so it's kind of hard to force free speech to become equal when we don't even live in a society that's equal. That inequality will affect the type of speech that you are able to do. And that becomes a lot more obvious as speech moves to a new arena. A very modern one. The internet. Free speech today looks very different than it did in the time of John Stuart Mill. A lot of free speech laws cover things like literally having an opinion in public, writing in newspapers or being on TV, but we live in a society with internet. <laughs> I am speaking to you through the information superhighway, and things are different now. And the question is, has the philosophical idea of free speech caught up? And can it still apply on the internet? Or rather, can the spirit of free speech be carried over here? Historically, most speech has been done either in print or in person, and somewhat more recently in radio and TV. Speaking on the internet, though, is very, very new and has quickly become the dominant way that we do speech of any kind. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you went to speaker events or read a newspaper? Ugh. Plus, even older formats like print and TV are moving to sort of online counterparts anyway. Because the internet has changed the way that we do speech generally, it has become a speech amplifier. Never before in history have people had the access to other people who will listen to them as they do right now. Previously, if you wanted your speech to be as amplified as it is today, you would need wealth, connections, or power. But the internet has allowed us to reach an audience 
like never before. When it comes to speech, and especially political speech, it's useful to talk about it in terms of amplification and suppression. Being against suppression is basically the idea of why we have free speech laws in the first place. But obviously, there are many types of ways to amplify speech as well. The internet is very useful because it has worked as a platform for everyone, but all of those previous forms of amplification, such as having money and just being rich and powerful in, you know, society, they will also be able to take advantage of that platform. Suppression regarding speech, though, isn't just from the state or from the government. I'm using the term here to simply mean the opposite of amplification. Simply the concept of lacking opportunity to speak in the first place. Or at least to speak with any sort of power. If you are poor or don't have time, odds are that your speech will not actually reach a huge audience. Everyone has opinions, but not everyone can express those opinions freely. Even though we have the idea of free speech. That's because there are a lot of other things that are subconsciously or consciously suppressing the speech of everyone else. Which isn't a violation of free speech, everyone can say whatever they want, but it is a sort of violation against the spirit of free speech. Remember that the spirit of free speech is to present a living playing field for all ideas, but it's also to provide the public with an unbiased view of the current state of discussion. But, again, with factors that shift whose speech is amplified and whose speech is suppressed, it can give us an inaccurate view of how the discourse is operating. So despite the idea of free speech, the public discourse that we're having doesn't actually reflect the general populace, what everyone's thinking. It's more reflecting the people who can do the speaking. Whenever a celebrity does a political endorsement of a leftist figure, for example, they will always say like, ah, oh, you should, should stick to acting, stick to comedy, you, 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 this is not your playing field. To which they will rightly say that I can say whatever I want. I have free speech as well as you do. But what these individuals are spotting though, is that their speech as an individual isn't even close to the power that their speech has. Which isn't a groundbreaking take. You know this, as do the people who get angry at Hollywood elites. But the consequence of it is that speech maybe isn't as free as we thought. This is why most people you see online talking about free speech are free speech absolutists. Because anyone who acknowledges the sort of grey area we live within also has to acknowledge that there are limits to how free speech works, and that there probably should be. But that also leaves almost any discussion about free speech only to very weird free speech absolutists. Now you may think that by free speech absolutists, I'm referring to people on the right wing. But that's not really true. People from all sides of the political spectrum often complain about how their speech is being restricted in one way or another. They may use different language to do so, but they're still doing it. LGBT creators on YouTube being restricted because they're LGBT don't have the same opportunity to, to make online video, which is a major form of speech in the internet age. They're not using the free speech argument, but they're using the idea that like, hey, that's unfair. Is that a free speech violation? If it happened to people who use free speech language and rhetoric in that case, they probably would. But if it happens to people who only think about the letter of the law or think of themselves as an opposition to those free speech absolutist groups, they might just use other terminology. But we're talking about the exact same thing. The spirit of fairness. I thought about this myself. For example, in this video, YouTube is listening to every word that I'm using and scanning to see if I'm saying something that I shouldn't say. Something that isn't ad-friendly, perhaps. And depending on what they determine, the almighty algorithm will either promote or suppress this video. And following all of the rules, doesn't actually matter sometimes. A while ago I made a video about adult substances. That video became age-restricted because someone had flagged it as being promotional of said substances. I argued that nah, I didn't promote anything, sent it in for revision, and YouTube said that yeah, you're right, you have followed all of the rules, you have done all of the community guidelines, but they're still going to keep it restricted. 
And understandably, that video didn't do very well. And the conspiracy theory in me thinks that it may also have sabotaged the general view that the algorithm had on my channel for quite a while. Again, YouTube monitors everything in relation to videos and channels to make sure that they can be promoted or not. And so what is happening here is that the algorithm is now determining what speech is more allowed and what isn't allowed on the platform. You could argue that this is fine. YouTube is a private company. They have every right to do this, and they do. This isn't technically a free speech violation of any kind. This is an argument that kind of strikes me as very weird, because whenever people are spreading harmful ideas on the internet, people will often defend platforms removing them by saying, well, they're a free company, they can do whatever they want, and, you know, I agree with that in principle. But oftentimes, these discussions don't go further than that and just sort of concede that corporations have a significant amount of power over the way we do speech. And is that the way we want to have it? In an age where we do most of our social interaction via the internet, especially in these uh, pandemic times, we have to sort of also understand that maybe public protections of speech should also apply on the internet, or should they? This is a point that I think that many on my side of the political aisle don't interact with that much. We do when it's an obvious case of discrimination, like when LGBT educators are being suppressed. But we are also not grappling with the issue that that control is still in the hands of YouTube in this case. In this case, YouTube has said for years that the algorithm doesn't discriminate, that they do regular checks on the code to make sure that it doesn't actually impact LGBT creators, and yet almost every LGBT creator that I know is saying a different story. And if we don't really want to discuss the idea of free speech here, we're also kind of conceding that entire discussion to far-right weirdos. And if we want to do that, Okay, but by doing that we're also saying that these websites should have power of discussion. That they should be the ones who decide what we get to talk about or not. Either by choice or by inadvertent algorithmic decisions. And I'm not really okay with either of those positions. In addition to this, I want to talk about a different phenomenon that is also exclusively happening on the internet, but that not a lot of people have connected to free speech. The idea of the filter bubble. You heard about this. It's the thing that you hear about intermittently, the thing that a lot of IT techs are really freaking out about, and something that could potentially have destructive properties on the foundations of democracy, but at the same time don't really want to do anything about. The filter bubble is the idea that the internet has filters to determine what it shows you and what it doesn't. Anything that you like will be shown to you more often. Anything that you dislike will be kept away from you. Websites do this in order to increase interactivity, to make sure that you're more active, and to make sure that you like the website more. But it also limits the voices that you hear being discussed. A consequence of this is that you will end up hanging out with people who believe pretty much the same thing that you will believe. Which, to me, is great because I believe the correct things so, you know, I don't necessarily want to be exposed to people who disagree with me. And some people will argue that this is great, I don't have to hang out with the weirdos. But the problem is that no one hangs out with the weirdos. The only people who hangs out with the weirdos are other weirdos, and they just make the, each other more and more weird. Suddenly, they aren't exposed to ideas that will challenge the weirdness. But how does this connect to free speech? Well. Remember how I said that limits on free speech are almost always imposed on the speaker? Well, a filter bubble is a sort of filter imposed on the listeners. Imagine that you're in a town square, you're having a speech, but the only people who listen to you in the crowd are people who already agree with you. You still have a right to say what you do. You haven't actually been punished, and no one has been punished in this scenario. But the point of free speech doesn't work anymore, and suddenly the speech becomes something else. It's no longer about the free discussion of ideas, 
but you're more preaching to the choir, which is fine. That's what I do here. I don't really want to talk to people who don't agree with me that much politically. I'm fine to do it. I welcome them to watch my videos, but I don't really want to have a Skype conversation with you or a Twitch debate. I don't, I don't want to do that. I've had one Twitch debate in my entire career as a YouTuber and it went disastrously south. But here's the thing though. Here's where I think free speech absolutists are coming from. They see the consequences of free speech being restricted while not actually being restricted. And here's where we, people who think that free speech isn't actually being violated, are completely dropping the ball. <laughs> because right now, the only people talking about this in free speech terminology are the weird people. So they look at our discussions where we say that everything is fine from a free speech standpoint, except for, you know, money in politics and social media bubbles and filters and algorithms. Um, outside of that, like free speech though, it's, it's completely fine. That issue is fine. They see us being sort of dismissive of this problem. And therefore they think that we're on the side of the suppression rather than the inconvenient truth that free speech on the internet isn't actually being infringed upon, but it's more circumvented indirectly being suppressed. It's just that a lot of people don't see where it's coming from or don't talk about the source of it. So their gut feeling says that free speech is obviously being suppressed. Now you may think that I'm going to say that free speech should be more free on the internet. Obviously we're having some issues here and maybe we should open the floodgates even more than they already are. But that's not a great idea either. As you've probably seen in the last couple of years, truth is becoming a bit more um, hard to define in some political circles. Facts become alternative facts, and the misinformation is on an all-time high. One reason, I think, is that misinformation is a good way to exploit these errors, these quirks in the current way we do discourse. They tell the audience that, hey, you see all the things that are wrong, in how we speak, how we converse, and it's their fault. <laughs> they take this uncertainty and they place a seed of blame, and then they can spread whatever misinformation they want in there for them to advocate their own agenda. And speaking of misinformation to promote an agenda, we're gonna talk about a certain fake online university. Ah, uh, ProgerU, truly the bane of every YouTuber's existence. All of the issues that I've talked about are probably best exemplified when talking about ProgerU, a fake university run by a man called Dennis Prager. Like I mentioned, free speech has flaws, those flaws can be exploited, and those flaws offer dangers. Now, I won't be the first person to discuss why ProgerU is bad, and I won't be the last. This isn't a takedown or a dunk on ProgerU and its various misaligned views. Rather, it's an exploration of how ProgerU exemplifies all of the issues that I've been talking about when it comes to free speech issues. If you've been lucky enough not to know what ProgerU is, it is an online university meant for conservative viewpoints and education. They offer courses on all sorts of topics, but with an unapologetic conservative slant. They make no secret that they are pro-right and anti-left. Their elevator pitch is they make short courses about all sorts of topics, they offer course materials, and they offer a free, good, hearty, conservative education to anyone who wants it. But it's not a real university. They are not accredited, they don't offer any credits, you won't get anything material out of watching their videos, except for education. They just call themselves a university so they sound more legit, and boy do they need it. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with having free education on the internet. That's basically what I delude myself into thinking that I'm doing. But what is happening here is that it operates more as a propaganda machine for the conservative views of Prager himself. I say propaganda because the information that they give you isn't necessarily wrong, 
but it is omitting truths and presented in such a way to give you, the viewer, a false impression of the topic that you're talking about. Is climate change really real? Does the gender pay gap exist? Was Robert E. Lee really that bad? They present this using pseudo-intellectual language and graphs and flashy aesthetics, but with very little actual content. Look at this graph, it's hilarious. As we can see, artistic standard drops over time. And suddenly now art means nothing except for personal expression, which definitely is a problem that's happening in the art world. PragerU makes short videos that are easily digestible and not too offensive in and of themselves, marketed specifically to millennials and Gen Zs. They want to seem appealing enough so that anyone who watches them and isn't fully submerged in the topic that they're talking about might come away thinking that, oh, that's a that's a fun informational video. Thank you very much, PragerU. The videos are also sometimes shown in classrooms all over America and sometimes outside of it probably by teachers who don't actually want to teach that day and just googled in uh, the subject of today's topic and showed the first video that came up. And listen, I've been there. Teaching sucks. The length of their content also makes it easy to share. If it's short, people don't really expect a long dissertation or a nuanced discussion. And sure, you're watching a long YouTube video about one specific topic, but most people don't really have the energy to do that, so a short, easily digestible video is much more attractive to someone who is like on the go. In the same amount of time it takes for you to watch this video, Progger You may have educated you on a dozen different topics at this point. It's like Vine, but for the alt-right. This combined with aggressive marketing and a fair amount of surprising diversity in their hosts means that the videos are actually pretty popular among young people. And it does change minds. According to viewers who were surveyed about whether or not a video has changed their opinion on a topic, a lot of people said that it had. And of course it does. If you're a student who isn't involved in a specific topic and your teacher is showing you a video on said topic and that's your first introduction to it, you're going to take it at face value. And I'm not the first person to say this. Mark Oppenheimer, writing from Mother Jones, says, Most of us are fairly ignorant about most things. So what happens when our outlook on a subject is based largely on one slick, accessible video? Knowing little about Native American politics, I found Naomi Schaefer Riley's argument that American Indian poverty is largely the fault of well-meaning government overreach pretty persuasive. I'm sure there's another side. But what if fact-checking her thesis isn't high on my priority list? The thing is though, PragerView isn't just classically conservative, whatever that means. A lot of people have pointed out that there's a pretty clear pipeline between the more innocent looking PragerView content into more insidious and darker ideologies. A lot of their videos allude to far right conspiracy theories. Hosts that come on to talk about various topics oftentimes sell books that promote a more insidious ideology as well. And hosts taking part in PragerU do see a boost in sales of their own books. So their ideology is spread, not just via the direct messaging in the videos. But what does this have to do with free speech? Well, obviously, Dennis Prager has the right to say whatever he wants, but we're talking about amplification and suppression, right? PragerU is very concerned about free speech, both their own right to say whatever they damn want, and about the free speech in the entire Western world. Does free speech offend you? But let's start talking about the things we mentioned before. Because of how YouTube operates as a website, once you start watching PragerU, you will be suggested similar type of channels. Channels that other fans of PragerU are also fans of. And oftentimes they will refer to other creators who have also been hosts on PragerU. And they might take you deeper into the ideological rabbit hole. But if you were to ask them who is causing this, they'd probably just say big leftist corporations. Which, uh... Eh. Watch any one of our videos and you'll immediately realize that Google slash YouTube censorship is entirely ideologically driven. For the record, our videos are presented by some of the finest minds in the Western world. It's like a balloon. It's intellectually a balloon to left. Or they will suggest some ominous leftist organization working in secret to destroy freedom and free speech. An organization that hates freedom and science and facts and just wants to redact everything from public knowledge. We all hate free speech and we have to take away your people. 
But what we're seeing here is a symptom of the social media bubble. Once you take the first step into something that looks fairly innocent, it will take you deeper into the rabbit hole and further isolate you from opposing viewpoints. You, as the listener, obviously have a right to listen to whoever you want, and they, as speakers, their speech isn't being suppressed. But now, suddenly, you're no longer exposed to any opposing viewpoints, viewpoints that might prove Prager you wrong. And remember that discourse is about trying to find truths, disproving the wrongs of other people, coming to a common truth. And that can't happen if you're not listening to the other side. What PragerU is doing pretty effectively is using suppression that already exists to uneven the playing field in their advantage. Remember how free speech is supposed to have a level playing field, but PragerU is using a type of suppression in order to avoid any sort of free speech discussion. It's just that they're using it to avoid criticism. But obviously there's one big type of amplification that probably hits harder than most. One that, again, PragerU has a lot of. Let's talk about money as an amplifier. People have often talked, why isn't there a leftist alternative to PragerU? Someone who can make easily digestible short videos talking about you know, topics in a similar way that PragerU does, in order to disprove the lies, or at least come up with some sort of counterbalance. But this kind of ignores the economy of everything. Remember how I said that rich people have their speech much more amplified than people who don't have money. Well, when it comes to PragerU, they have money. Early in their history, they received funding from petrochemical billionaires, which, you know, that helps you when you want to set up as a sort of uh, informational startup. The petrochemical billionaires in question, the Wilkes brothers, also fund many other conservative media outlets, such as the Daily Wire and just Ted Cruz generally. And they're doing this in order to disseminate the viewpoints. But the left doesn't really have that sort of funding behind it. People talk a lot about how political video essayists are all like rich elitists, but like you can see how much I make on Patreon, it's not that much. But even pretty big YouTubers don't make enough to compare with petrochemical billionaire money. You can only really get that kind of money from working in petrochemicals. Oil, baby. The idea that money amplifies political speech is nothing new, but let's try to keep within the spirit of what free speech is supposed to do having a level playing field for all ideas. Now, in a world where money amplifies speech, the people who have the money are going to speak louder. That's just a fact of life. The Supreme Court case, Citizens United vs. FEC, has probably been the most notorious example of this. It ruled that spending money is a form of speech, and that you can't really restrict the ability of corporations to have that type of speech. And now suddenly, big corporations can now donate huge amount of money to political causes. But even before Citizens United, money in politics was still a huge problem. Individuals would still spend tons of money on advertising. Advertising that will shift the discourse no matter what people actually think. And I don't really see a lot of petrochemical billionaires in my Patreon feed, or in the Patreon feeds of my friends. But if you're a petrochemical billionaire and you want to donate to me, all your sins are forgiven, I will sell out instantly. But obviously there are a ton of ways to circumvent these sort of ups and downs in free speech. What if you don't actually care about having a level playing field, about reaching common truths? Well, that brings me to... In the last couple of years, it's no secret that misinformation has become the tools of the trade of a lot of far-right political figures. Like, yes, free speech definitely should apply, and in the society that we live in, corporations also have a freedom to restrict some freedoms on their platforms. But how much is a corporation allowed to lie? How much is an individual allowed to lie on the internet? The idea behind free speech is that if we can have a level playing field discussing truth and falsehoods, all those misinformation points will disappear. We can't have misinformation out there if everyone is allowed to debunk that misinformation together. But because we live in a society where money is influential, and because a lot of that speech is currently happening on the internet, we can definitely see that it doesn't really matter anymore. Some politicians have embraced the idea that they can lie as much as they want, because it doesn't matter. They can fund their own version of events, and even if 
people can match their level of speech, it doesn't matter anyway, because the people who support those politicians already exist in a filter bubble. They're never gonna hear the opposing side anyway. That's why I think a leftist version of PragerU wouldn't work. There have been people who tried, and there have been some people with marginal success, but I think that the foundational idea, something to counter PragerU specifically, just can't exist. Because on one end, we have to amplify the speech to the level to match PragerU on its own. And then in addition to that, it would have to be so powerful speech that it would have to break the filter bubble. And I don't think that's going to happen. So there's something wrong here, right? We can see the flaws in the system and we can see ways to exploit those flaws in order to have our own speech boosted and suppress those that we don't agree with. But we can also take this, the result of seeing free speech not really working the way it should be, and claim that it's working against us. And we can do that for both profit and for fame. I mean, you've probably heard of bigots saying in the media that we are being silenced while also saying that they are being silenced in mainstream media outlets. But you can use that on other platforms or in general media in order to gain sympathy and to claim a martyrship in the cause of actual free speech. This is something that far-right personalities have mastered and something that I think the left can actually learn something from. PragerU, again, has made this part of their branding. Every single one of their videos are technically a fundraiser for themselves in order to fight against the censorships of YouTube. It is, of course, a lie, meant to reinforce a victimhood mentality in both its viewers and probably the people who create it. And remember, the cause of this is very similar to what is happening to, for example, leftist or LGBT creators on YouTube as well. Except we don't really frame it as a freedom of speech conversation. And legally, we would be correct. But PragerU has pretty smartly focused on the spirit of free speech instead and are framing their entire narrative around that, which is a much easier cause to get riled up about. That's not to say that censorship can happen unfairly. It definitely does. But most of the time, I feel like people are claiming that they're being censored in order to just grift on it. I mean, if they were really being censored, we wouldn't actually be hearing about it. This stems, obviously, as many people have pointed out, from a basic misunderstanding about what free speech actually is. Yes, you can say whatever you want, but no one has to listen to you. You don't have a right to be listened to. But that doesn't matter on the internet, where you can take the idea that no one wants to listen to you and make it into content, into branding, where you can turn it into your own personal oppression Olympics. Help, help, I'm being repressed. And this is a strategy that works on two levels. On one end, you can claim to be a martyr of the cause of free speech, get a bunch of clout from people who claim to care about that stuff. But on the other hand, you can also use it to manipulate big companies, saying that like, you can't censor my videos, you can't suppress me in the algorithm because that's censorship, and you can't do that because that's wrong. On the other hand, there are people who make a brand out of abusing and bullying, basically, on their channels. But because they don't want to be seen as suppressing free speech, YouTube lets them be up anyway. I wanted to make this video for a few reasons. I feel like a lot of leftist content creators don't really want to grapple with why the right wing talks so much about free speech. A lot of these discussions just boil down to, well, that's not what the law says. To which a lot of right-wingers will say, well, it's not really about the letter of the law. And so I feel like a large part of the conflict on this issue is actually just a miscommunication. We just have different types of frozen peaches. We just gotta open the door and let them dethaw. I lost track of this analogy. Okay, I'm making some jokes here and I'm overly simplifying a very complicated issue. But I'm talking about PragerU as a sort of microcosm for a much larger problem. I think it's actually pretty smart and ingenious by people who are on the right side of politics to have sort of adopted the free speech mantle, because anyone who then opposes them will then see as opponents to free speech. 
I think this is also a reason why people who are pro-free speech are often free speech absolutists. Because the reasonable answer that most of us have is that speech should be free, but there should be some limitations in how we deal with that, and it's a gray area and stuff like that. And it's a nuanced take, but that doesn't really work. It's more digestible, it's more easy, and it's more comfortable to just claim, no, we need free speech, and we need it now. We need to start talking about leveling the playing field to live more in the spirit of a free speech should be. And I think we need to start using that type of language as well. When we talk about rights, we usually talk about corporate overreach and that being the problem, and it is. But that's a language that a lot of people who don't already agree with us would use. You're not gonna see them blame capitalism as the root of all of this. They're not gonna blame social inequality for this. I mean, they can't, because then they have to grapple with a core part of their own ideology. They're just gonna blame us for it. The right-wing monopoly on freedom and liberty is working against us here, because in actuality a living playing field in terms of discussions would be more liberty for more of us. The truth is though, in the last couple of years, free speech has been on the decline. Actual free speech, by the way. Obviously, people who are saying that free speech isn't actually being infringed upon on the internet that much are, to a large extent, correct. But these issues whatever you want to call it, aren't really making things better. The symptoms of the issue, whether they come from free speech or internet suppression or unbalance or corporate overreach or whatever, look very similar to regular people who just happen to exist on the internet. Corporations are right now using political advertising on their own social media sites to lobby politicians and voters into doing their interests for them. Sites like Amazon are using Twitch to campaign against unions, Uber is using its own app to campaign against laws that would benefit the drivers. And sure, none of these things are actually free speech issues, but it's an issue where speech backed by power and money can easily suppress speech that has neither, especially in an age where most of the communication happens on corporate-owned websites. And sure, it's not actually a free speech violation. This entire video uh, deals almost nothing with free speech. But maybe it should? Like, maybe it should be about free speech? At least the right wing uses terminology that gets people politically motivated. Talking about a discriminatory algorithm isn't as uh, catchy. Eh. So is free speech under threat? Yeah. Kind of dramatically, actually. But it's not because the left wants to take away your... Mm. Rather, it's because speech is amplified and modified in certain ways that most of us don't actually have access to. I count myself lucky. It's because the internet operates in such a way where 99% of its users won't have access to the type of speech that the very extremely rich do. So it's only the extremely rich that really have their viewpoint argued. At least, they have it more than most. So the solution here is obvious. We just have to make me extremely rich too, and then I can debate them in the free marketplace of ideas. Go to my Patreon. But that also draws me to the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. You've heard of them before. They're a learning platform with thousands of different classes for people who are creative and maybe want to expand their skill set. It's curated specifically for learning, so there are no ads. And with an annual membership, it costs less than $10 a month. I can personally recommend Productivity for Creatives, a course that I keep using and that I'm actually learning quite a lot from. The first thousand subscribers who click the link in my description will get a trial to Skillshare Premium Membership. So go, get creative. It's a much better alternative than uh, I wouldn't recommend Skillshare if I didn't believe in it. I use it frequently to learn more skills to use in my videos and just in my daily life. So give it a shot. I think it's great. I'd like to thank everyone who watched this video. And if you like it, please subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment if you like it. It's, it goes well in the algorithm. I'd like to thank all of my patrons. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Aini Salmanen, Alicia Crawford, Alki Historiker, Amanda B, Ashley Kitchen, Athiet, Austin K, Autumn, Catherine Stenson, Catherine Gutierrez, Kerberspear, Dana Ferguson, Daniel Gollan, Emil Rutkowski, Emilia Clark, Fox Kant, Hannah Richards, Jade C, 
Jane Lusby, Janelle Torrison, Jareth Arnold, Jay Parker, Jim Sterling, Jürgen Danielsen, Joshua Anelik, LPQ Silver, Linus 2.0, Lyra Wardrill, Madison Jacob, Melvin Soa, Michaela, Marimer, Natalie Kapur, Nia Pasaka, Nork46, Pat, Philomene Leminu, Phobos2390, Rose Brunton, Riley Knox, Sitsries, Sonic Bread, Thoros of Mir, Tiffany A, Wim Fuhussel, Vinder, Vivian Crow, Wolfgang the Grand High Exalted Wizard, and Soya Kent. Thank you.